Rich Scheidner will uh, join us, veteran stand-up comedian mm. in the uh, second hour. I'll do a one-on-one -on -one with him. He's the uh, subject of that Doc I Am comic from 2010. Very interesting and uh, sometimes uncomfortable journey it's into a solid doc. his yeah. uh, comeback into stand-up comedy. Rich uh, performed on uh, Johnny Carson back in the day. David Letterman made it through Carson to uh, Leno. And, uh, oh, was married to Carol Liefer from yeah. uh, 81 to 87. Mm -hmm. Interesting story, interesting case. So we'll uh, talk to him about that. And speaking of married, a lot of us remember him fondly from Married with Children. Married with Children, mm -hmm. uh, Roseanne, wow. Beverly Hills Cop 2, Roxanne. Under the, uh, movie. Steve I Martin love movie. That movie. Yeah, people love that movie. Cyrano de Bergerac. Wrote for a Foxworthy show and Titus and Roseanne back in the day. He's been a veteran, been there and done that. Very insightful. He's got a new history of comedy show coming up, which uh, I'm interested in uh, getting into the history of stand up with him as well. All right, a uh, couple of rando thoughts. Uh, first, I got poison ivy. Oh, Mazel tov. No shit. Yeah. I Coincidentally, had a... we were just walked by a shitload of poison ivy in Maine. It's everywhere, laying in the trails and whatever. Yeah, I had a rash on my arm. I didn't think much of it. Then it spread to my other arm, and I still didn't think too much of it, but I showed it to Dr. Drew earlier in the Ooh. day, and he went, poison ivy. What's, What's the difference between poison ivy and poison oak? oak. Is it more or I less think he said same? poison oak, actually. Because okay. so that's what I was That encounter. may be the difference. Let's I, see it. I have, it's it's uh, it's a nice yeah. red rash Could there, you know? and then it goes over the top of the arm there. It's nice and red there. Went to the other arm, went sort no. of up the arm. It jumped, yeah. A little. What are you um, getting for that? Clobetazole? A little steroid cream? <laughs> <laughs> Ivermectin. <laughs> I'm using the horse paste on there. Um, and then uh, I said. Are you going to get anything for it? Or well, Drew, ride it out? He said uh, put cortisone on it or whatever. No, but, you wow. got to do what the Brady's do. You got to put calamine lotion all over you and then tie oven mitts around your hands so you don't scratch. And then we got to form a band yes. so we can pay for mom and dad's the engraved platter. Platters. So uh, I said to him, but this is kind of why I like Dr. Drew. I, he said, uh, you've been hiking around lately? Been out in the horse trail? I said, well, not really. I've been traveling and not really hiking. And he said, probably got it from Phil. Oh, because oh, he's up in the yeah. Phil's out running around yeah, yeah, doing yeah. Chase, chasing God knows what and yeah. to God knows where. And then whenever I see Phil, it's a full right. body rub down, right, right. you know. So uh, some of it got on Phil, and then he polluted me. Is oh. it is it uh, uh, objectionable? Is it is it hurt or is it? I I don't whatever? mind. I <laughs> for me, oh, I'm, is it irritating? I, no, I, I but I have a high threshold for irritation, except okay. for with other human beings. <laughs> I was going to say all you are is irritated. <laughs> I, I have. I am irritated by the social irritation, behavior, vicissitudes of man. But I'm not wow. really irritated by skin related okay. stuff. So uh, a little itchy. <laughs> it's more like what is this and where did this come from? I uh, cut myself with a knife again yesterday because man, somebody gave me whoever Gina, get some help. gave me. We're here for you. <laughs> registry. Or do your thigh and get it <laughs> over with. Say. I, re I was going at it too hard with an avocado and I sliced my hand. And Let's cry for help. I wanted to show the uh, little guy that, you know, it's not a big deal. He's really freaks out at blood and everything. So I got some of that liquid band aid mm -hmm. that you spray. I'm like, watch this. It's no big deal. He passed out. On I the floor. didn't realize that you're really not supposed to spray that on an open wound. Ooh, <laughs> it, that hurt. I was. I literally should have been like poking myself with a fork in the leg. It hurt so bad. I was choking back tears. I was like, it's nothing. I'm fine. Air, the thing that heals the wounds the fastest is air. Yeah, well, And too I've late. found that the band aids <laughs> tend just to keep it yes, moist, moist and keep it going. So yep. I usually go with the open air. Uh, another side thought. I was uh, on the plane, and, uh, oh, something I forgot to mention. <laughs> you're Again. rubbing people with their forearms. <laughs> yeah, you're giving the forearm bump to everybody. Had another bash. <laughs> situation <laughs> where flew cross-country with Mike August, and the person in front of him never reclined. Oh, My course, person like reclined bastard. before Instantly. we took off, and his person no. never made the recline. And I looked at Mike, and I said, God damn, it's the second flight where the person in front of you did not recline. And he just looked at me, and he said, they declined to recline. And then he laughed real Good. hard <laughs> and went back to watching movies with no with sound. He was so proud of himself. He was so happy with himself. Um, as, as I was sitting in my chair, and I, and I realized that I was sitting in my seat on the flight, I was wearing these... Uh, 
kind of basketball trunks and I was wearing this sort of hoodie thing and it was all made out of like nylon and whatever, low traction mm. materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found myself setting like my phone on my lap and having it <laughs> zip goes. down my thigh right. and onto the floor. And I was trying to, my earbuds mm -hmm. and stuff, everything was just sliding all denim. over the place. I thought to myself, there, I would travel with traction shorts. If there was such a thing as traction shorts, okay. I don't know if we make Cotton. them out of felt. It's the exact I don't, opposite I, of a short I, I, I don't be. know what we make them out of. <laughs> Maybe we do the outside with something well, that's like a got patch. A, a little grip. A Velcro patch. A, a, a patch. A patch. A patch where you could just kind of, your phone, boom. Mm. Maybe your wallet, yeah. maybe your earbuds. A little rubber Whatever. Just, just patch it. Yeah, this is like my sweaty palm slacks. Mm. Where you have that patch on your oh, right. Oh yes, yes, yes. The patch but on the before right you go thigh. for the hand sick. Yeah, on the hand right shake. thigh is just that patch. Like they have a like hunting that. vest, and it's like quilted where the butt of the gun would go. Sure. You know, just quick, quick, dry the oh, hand on the, on the patch. Anyway, <laughs> anti skid uh, shorts and uh, sweatshirts for yeah. traveling. You could do anti skid outside and inside if you know what I mean. Well, yeah, yeah the mark. Yeah. Skid, yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, Brian's got the, uh, 007 movie, which, uh, Hollywood. I'm excited about. I'm kind of heard good things about it. I love James Bond. I like, I like the franchise. And this I is know. the last of Daniel Craig. They've announced. Yes. This, they pre-announced. This will be the last Daniel Craig. Yeah. James I think, Bond uh, movie. Grace Jones is going to replace yes, him. Right. Oh God. But, well, well, her thing was like knickknack or, or May Mayday. Mayday. She was a Bond Nick villain. Nick no, she was Bond was the, <laughs> Nick Knack was the Asian. I no, that think. was oh odd no, job. that odd job. Nicknack was is Rocky Nick Holder, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm -hmm. uh, that's um, uh, uh, flim flam, riff raff, riff raff. <laughs> All right, there's too many names, but the point is, is she was a was. villain. She was a henchman villain, yeah. sidekick henchman. villain yeah. in 1988 or 85. It was. I, I'm a bit of a Bond fan. It was uh, the, the not very good Bond movie with Christopher Walken as the Bond villain. Mm -hmm. It was a view to a kill. Mm, I believe yeah. that was 85. Um, Think about you, in Roger Moore's last movie. Should we, uh, let's let's get into the Baldywood. Yeah. I, I want to, you're a Bond fan. I want to, I, I want to see this movie. <laughs> Tell you if a movie's good Brian will review the flicks that he's seen Up on the big screen or in his Netflix queue Before you spend bucks, remember his taste sucks He loved that train wreck piece of shit Transformers 2 Hooray for Bollywood No Time to Die is the latest I don't even bother counting how many James Bond movies. There's 22, 23, mm. somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, the latest, maybe 24, latest James Bond 007 adventure. Uh, this is a, in theaters now, of course. If you want to see it, you're going to have to venture out to theaters. Uh, are, did I get that right? Is it, no, it's not streaming anywhere, is it? I haven't heard about no, it. No, no. Okay, and I, I think it's 27 movies. Wow. Uh, According that, to Google. Is that including Dawson's favorites? Uh, 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 Never Say Never, Never Say Never Again. I like that one. He does like <laughs> it. Uh, okay, sorry. Back to this. Uh, directed by Kerry Fukunaga. Uh, he directed a great movie called Sin Nombre. You guys know of or seen Sin Nombre? Heard about it. Sweet. Yeah, it's a it. really good movie. It's streaming on Hulu. Footnote to this, if you guys are looking for a really good, intense movie about MS-13. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's on Hulu right now. So he directed that. Sin Nombre without a number? Uh, I, I think it's My nameless. My Spanish is nameless. rusty. Sim oh, okay. Or am I get that right? Oh, yeah. Without a name. Nombre's name, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. uh, nameless or without that. a name or whatever. Uh, starring Daniel Craig, of course, is 007. His last outing is 007. It's been announced. Uh, also starring Lea Sidhu, um, Rami Malek, Ray Fiennes, Jeffrey Wright, Naomi Harris, Lashana Lynch, and Anna DeArmas. Uh, make an appearance in this. 84% of Rotten Tomatoes, last I checked. Um, this is a very good, bordering on excellent, Whoa. James Bond movie. Now, Daniel Craig's have been up and down. He, Casino Royale, really good. Oh, yeah, the, thank you for getting the, uh, the audience score. 88. So people very are good. enjoying this movie uh, universally. It's all over. Uh, it, it's, get, it's going over well with everybody. Uh, Casino Royale, 
very good. Uh, Quantum of Solace, not so good. Um, then there was uh, Skyfall, very good. Then there was Spectre, not so good. And then this one rounds out his, uh, you know, his journey, his bonds with a really good entry. And an amazing thing I thought about as a real fan of the series, no James Bond actor has ever ended their run with a good movie. Mm. Mm. It's always been like they petered out, right? Or they mm-hmm. just kind of just kind of circled, you know, circled the drain or coasted to a stop, and right. then just kind of right. reboot with another actor. And here we go. This is the first good final James Bond actor movie. Also amazing. No James Bond character or actor has ever been given like a proper send off on screen. Mm-hmm. And without getting getting into what happens in the third act. Daniel Craig is given like a proper send off in this movie. Like they honor his like you know his run as James mm-hmm. Bond, and it was uh, it was nice to see. It was nice to see it actually felt like it was planned. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As opposed to like oh it just kind of ran out of steam, right. and now we're gonna re- reboot with Timothy Dalton or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was cool. Um, Could have used a little more Ana de Armas. She was one of the best parts of the movie. Also beautiful, doesn't hurt. Could have used a little less Rami Malek. He was not. In the, in the canon of James Bond villains, does mm-hmm. not go near the top. Mm. He was just kind of there. He seems passive. He was, but he was, he was very understated. Mm-hmm. He wasn't menacing in any... Did anyone else see this movie? He was very understated, not menacing in any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. And also his motivation seemed a little strange. Like, you get into like, okay, he's, he's out for revenge for this reason. But there's like, well, then why is he trying to take over the world? But mm-hmm. neither here nor there. Bond mm-hmm. villains do what they do. I, I like the throwback because like he had, he had a, a, a lair like built into the side of a mountain. Nice. Like, yeah. it was, or an island in the side of like nice. an island. It was, it was a full on like, all right, we're back to like old school James Bond villains. It was very cool. Um, what else? Oh, so the mythology of James Bond. Like a lot of people are like, um, why, 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 why has James Bond been going since 1962? Do they ever acknowledge that there's like James Bond has been doing his thing? The character has been doing his thing for mm-hmm. whatever it's been 50, 50 60 years, right. and it's like the mythology that some fans like to um, embrace is that the 007 moniker, the code, the nickname, the James Bond identity, everything gets passed down through the years. In a Doctor Who-ish way. Yeah, mm-hmm. it gets passed down through the years right. and like a new agent will adopt, because there's only so many 00 right. agents, et cetera, et cetera. And they actually handled that really good here. I don't want to get into a very cool reveal, but they handled that where it's like, oh, the 007 thing will, you know, goes on forever and has, has existed in mm-hmm. perpetuity. It's a... They did well in this movie. It's good. It's good. It, it's long. It's like Where two would hours. you have it if the critics have it at 84, 87, or somewhere in there? Where, where, what do you think? Critics have it at 84. I'm a fan, and I was very pleased. Um, there are certain parts that landed emotionally, which mm-hmm. I've n- never happened in a James Bond movie. I'd have it closer to the audience score, 88 or 89, the wow. higher 80s. Yeah, nice. I really enjoyed it. It's long. You know, you're going to go to the bathroom two hours and... F- 43. Oh, 243. Yeah. Yeah. Is it your favorite James Bond movie? No, it is not. Not mm-hmm. even close. But it's very, very good. It's top third for oh, sure. Wow. And uh, this is a good one to see in the theater, seeing the big screen. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a James Bond movie. It's got all the gadgets. What's your favorite? I like all the gadgets, by the way. I like the cars. I like the gadgets. I like the lairs. Just like, oh, just, I've done a lot of thinking about this. Just like baseball players, like you can't say Babe Ruth is the greatest of all time because what, what, what would Babe Ruth do against today's pitching? You right. know what I mean? Like but, you have to judge him against right. the era. He wouldn't be pitching. He wouldn't. <laughs> he might be, actually. I don't, I don't know how well he could hit. Um, but uh, uh, the I, I like you know uh, Goldfinger for its era. I like uh, Octopussy for its era. Goldeneye might be my favorite. Um I love Casino Royale. Even mm-hmm. Sky falls a little above this one, but this is still a very good entry, and I can't uh, find too much wrong with it, aside from maybe it could have trimmed 15, 20, but give it a, you know, give it what it is. It's a, it's its final, final swan song on screen. And it's very good. I recommend it. Now, what do we have? Do we have a black or gay or female James Bond yes. coming down Why the not pike? all three? Yeah. Yes. We have a female. Is she gay too? Uh, I can't say that. Well, she has a short haircut. So mm-hmm. Do the math, buddy. Mm-hmm. But uh, in this movie, there is another double O agent who is introduced uh-huh. who Good. you could see them laying the groundwork for this being a continuation, but she is uh, a woman of color uh, and she's a double O agent. So. Lashana mm-hmm. Lynch. Oh, yeah, right? Lashana Lynch. And she, she's great. She, she was at a fun interplay. Uh, it, was a, it was a good casting. 
All right. Check Outro. Hooray for Bollywood. All right. I got a bunch of clips here to uh, play. It was sort of uh, inspired by Sanjay Gupta. Went on to a Joe Rogan show. Ooh. And uh, Joe Rogan kind of let him have it for the whole ivermectin thing because uh, he got it and he took ivermectin. He took everything. He took everything. He because, said, I threw the kitchen sink at this thing. Right. And then they went on and said, Joe Rogan's eating horse paste. Right. And um, it's a couple of things. Drew always goes nuts because he's prescribed ivermectin to millions of people or at least thousands of people. What's it ostensibly for? It's, it's ostensibly b- 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 before COVID. We'll be we can, uh, well, Chris, who just stepped out, maybe it, Dawson, it, you can check the James Bond. wiki page on ivermectin. According it, to it was, Twitter, it's a horse dewormer. It was invented maybe 20 something, 30 something years ago is a, basically a dewormer for humans because a lot of refugees who came oh, here. If you have like a, would like get it. God or well, look, if you came from some mm-hmm. village in Nicaragua and you came to the United States, you just got it. Right. Because maybe you had it, yeah. maybe you didn't have it, but it's safe. So you get it. Well, yeah. But and everyone coming here across the border from Haiti should be getting it. Right. Maybe maybe they are. Like the point is, is when if you came here with rivers that had these parasites in it, I uh, would also use it for head lice and scabies and oh, river okay. blindness, but it was mainly for, it was for parasites. Right. And if you came from a place that had parasites, then you got it prophylactically right. or not even prophylactically. You just got it when you sure. came here because you could have parasites. Good, and I love that all of a sudden when you're on Twitter, everybody's an expert. Everybody knows everything about ivermectin. Ketamine was a horse tranquilizer and that is used broadly and widely for humans. And... As I said to Drew, well, what percentage of stuff makes its way to the veterinarian sector after we use it on on us? And he point. said, I don't know, 80 percent. Sure. We'll get down to your Mammals. family dog. Right. If, if you if, if it works on human right. beings long enough, where we usually put the humans before the, the, the bovine. But once it works on us and we figure it out a dose and, and we give it to the animal community. And um, God, I think I was. um Thinking about um, oh, what uh, it, like uh, what is the most prescribed antiviral sort of uh, zimoxicillin or oh well, yeah, I'm sure Zithromax. I'm sure it's something for all of it. Uh, no, I I was thinking I'm going I'm going penicillin? way back to penicillin. Oh. Yeah, like they made penicillin for people, but. They'll give it to the pet. They'll give it to the horse. Out of mold, by the way. Out of mold, so it's horse mold. Right, it's penicillin. <laughs> so uh, I don't think. I don't think Joe, I think he took umbrage to them saying he was taking horse paste. Right. Um, journalistically, it's sort of insane, which is, yes, it is for horses, but it's first for humans. And obviously, Joe would consult with his doctor and get the human version it of it in, in the dose that, that his doctor thinks is effective. And then there's another argument, which is, is it effective? And that answer is, f- for, for me... It's a little less of, is it effective? Because we may not know, but that's between you and your doctor. Mm -hmm. And then the real question is, is it dangerous? So if Brian, you have a condition, if your doctor said, I don't know, Try Robitussin. See if you can get a hit off Mike's uh, <laughs> bountiful the job that yeah. he travels with. Or, or take a children's uh, aspirin or something. You'd go, well, does it, does it help? And they'd go, I don't know. It may help. And then your next question is, is that, well, is it dangerous? And right. if the answer is, well, it's not dangerous, then you'd go, well, fuck it. I'll give it, I'll a, give try. it a try. It's funny that, about that example as I take children's aspirin every day on my doctor's recommendation. Right. Simp. May help, <laughs> may not, Shape, but soy not, beta not, bitch. Not, not dangerous. So uh, Sanjay uh, took a trip over to Rogan's experience, and we'll play you this two-minute exchange because Rogan wasn't having anything, uh, wasn't having it. Of course there were. And we'll get our we'll get our uh, sound worked out. Horse dewormers, not a flattering thing. I get it's that. It's a lie. It's a lie on a news network, it, and it, it's a lie that's a willing. That's that's a lie that they're conscious of. This is not a mistake. Yeah, they're unfavorably <laughs> framing it as veterinary medicine. Well, the FDA put this thing out. You saw that. Did you see the thing that the FDA put out? 
What did the FDA put out? <laughs> it was a tweet, and it was snarky. I admit it. They said, you are not a horse, you are not a cow, stop taking this stuff, or something like Why that. Why would you say that when you're talking about a drug that's been given out to billions and billions of people, a drug that was responsible for one of the inventors of it making the Nobel the, Prize. The Nobel Prize in 2015. 15, yeah. Yeah, no, a, a drug well, that has been shown to stop viral replication in vitro. You know that, right? I, I, Why would they lie? and say that's horse dewormer. I can afford people medicine, motherfucker. <laughs> this is ridiculous. It's just a lie. I don't think anyone is thick. But don't you think that a lie like that is dangerous on a news network when you know that they know they're lying? You know that they know that I took medicine. Like, here it is. This is ivermectin. You got this it with right you. here. Somebody gave it to me. All right, hang on. I, I, do see, you, the, the thing is, we're, we're, we're like going so fast. Like, I feel like I'm missing. I'm missing. Do you think I want that that's to, a problem that your news network was not, lies? Well, I don't. I don't. Dude, I mean, what did they say? They lied what and they said I was taking horse dewormer. First of all, it was prescribed to me by a doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Along they with shouldn't have said a it was a bunch horse. of if, other if medications. Was, if you got a human pill because there were people that were taking it the veterinary medication and i you're not obviously you got it from a doctor so that it shouldn't be called that ivermectin can be a very effective medication for parasitic disease and as you say it's probably you know i think what a quarter billion people have taken it around the world more, i get that way more so way but, more can, billions can, of people have taken it can i just come back to the one i want to talk about I, two, no, no, two, no no two no, things no. on you the have ledger to, you have before we get to that does it bother you that the news network you work for out and out lied, well, just outright lied about me taking horse dewormer. They, they, they shouldn't have said that. Why did they do that? I don't know. You didn't ask? You I, didn't think that was your, you're the medical I guy over there. I didn't ask. I should have asked before coming But they coming did it with such glee. No, Yes, Joe. they did. I watched. All right. So now that's why these people can't go on other shows. Right. Because that's unfortunately what happens to but them. But you, you know what the problem with that is? Hmm. This is like a correction in a newspaper. Nobody... Nobody knows about it. Like that's why I'm glad you're. Yeah, we're highlighting it's it. It's more, and they're well. It it it's got a little worse in the sense that later on, and I think we have a clip of Bill Mars onto this thing too. He did a whole ivermectin thing. It's not about ivermectin, and it's not about ivermectin being um, effective. It's about how you portray it. Mm -hmm. right. It's it's the you should be agnostic, which is first off, I don't even know why you would bring it up. Like his doctor said, take this stuff. Right. So he followed his physician's right. advice and he took this stuff. Why the drilling down? Why there's therapeutics, there's potential therapeutics out there. Why the ad hominem attack on every therapeutic? Why is it just no good? Why is it just for horses? Why is it just dangerous? You should be. Agnostic. You should just be like, well, I don't know. Well, let's Let do know. a study. A let's let's yeah. figure it out. There was reporting, and I don't know if it's factual or not. At this point, I have no idea. But there were there was reporting that people were going to pet stores and buying the shit out. Yeah, and right. So, but again, I don't know. Did there, that happen? There was not. a report that uh, what was that report? There was that Rolling Stones report that a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. showed up at a emergency room remember Maybe. this thing was going on and uh it's an interesting report because it was a totally bogus story that a bunch of people were ODing on it and showing up in an emergency room and pushing out gunshot victims like ah. they couldn't get to the gunshot victims because people were ODing on the horse version of ivermectin so said Rolling Stone about three weeks ago was a big thing if you look at the picture that Rolling Stone used for this story that this doctor reported on who didn't even work at the hospital anymore or hadn't been working at the hospital was totally bogus. Everyone just ran with it. And the picture they showed, and this was in July or August, was a bunch of people lined up in front of a hospital. Every one of them was wearing a hoodie and a skull cap and a parka. So you had to just know from the picture that that was Not an recent. old cold picture where was that max yeah they tweet they, they well here we'll put up the oklahoma the in august oklahoma, yeah. or september whenever whenever it was if you look at the picture Risk. every human being in supposedly oklahoma those are supposed to be like gunshot victims gu no gunshot victims are left waiting as a uh, horse dewormer oh. overdoses over uh, overwhelm the oklahoma hospital 
No such thing happened. This seems more like COVID testing for last Thanksgiving. Yes. And it's a bunch of pictures. Everyone is wearing either a hood or beanie or cap and has their jacket, has their winter wear on. So just from the picture alone, Rolling Stone. uh, On on Rolling Stone is dated beginning of September, September 5th. That would be hard to believe. In Oklahoma, Mm -hmm. it's probably 104 degrees (laughs) that uh, that day. So uh, then um, Sanjay... I think went back on to Don Lemon's show after Rogan, and then uh, Don Lemon just just kept it going. Like he he did not he did not take a step back. And Sanjay, once he got into the friendly confines of CNN, didn't stop him either. Which is like, all right, Doctor Sanjay Gupta, like why are we believing you now? You're the doctor. You work for CNN. Some of this stuff may be may have been said around you. I was about but to say, did he say this stuff? No, it but it'd be like Rogan's making the accusation. It well, couple things. Uh, he either said it or sat there silently while somebody else said it, which is you can't do that with Drew. You can't right. go here's let me tell you about medicine. He'll chime in immediately if I was sitting around, and Gina was saying, uh, you know, I much prefer uh, hollow corridors to solid corridors. I'd go, sweetie, you got a way off. Yeah, you're deaf. You're way wrong about it. I'm an expert in this. He did not do it. But he let uh, let Don Lemon do it as soon as he got back to CNN. Well, and what he said to Joe Rogan is they shouldn't have said that. Yeah, because he had no nothing else to say at that in that point. He was cornered. But I know it's in large part a tongue-in-cheek interview, you know, because it's Joe Rogan and there's a lot of, you're jockeying back and forth. But he, he did say something about ivermectin that I think wasn't actually correct about CNN and lying, okay? Ivermectin is a drug that is commonly used as a horse dewormer. So it is not a lie to say that the drug is used as a horse dewormer. I, I, I think that's important, and it is not approved for COVID, correct? That's right. That's correct. It, <laughs> it, it is not approved for COVID, and you're right. I mean, the FDA even put out a, a statement saying, you know, basically reminding people it was a strange sort of message from the FDA, but that said, you're not a horse, you're not a cow, stop taking this stuff, is essentially what they said, referring to ivermectin. Now, I think what, what Joe's All right. point... The, the point is it's gone right back to it. There's a way you can kind of correct this. It's for horses and humans like 80,000 right. other drugs. We're prescribing it to humans. And it's used off-label like 80,000 other drugs. Right. Plenty of no. people use, you know, this meant for this, but it works for that. Brian or they have some benefits. Brian is here today because that of that. That is true. Right. Uh, Aren't you so sick of an illness being politicized? I oh mean, my God. There's, a, there's a conservative way to cure COVID and there's a liberal way to cure COVID? Like, what's wrong so, with people? I, I don't know, but CNN, you're going to lose credibility. Just fuck it. Yeah, by the way, this is a non-story because right. he just used six other things and hydroxychlor or and uh, ivermectin. So just just keep walking. It's not a not yeah. not not a hill to die on. But I was uh, yelling about this to Dr. Drew, and it's basically CNN's take is it's four horses which first off they're lying they're just lying at this point obviously they know you have a phone you can go look it up it takes 10 seconds but it's essentially like saying uh uh i use you can use a brush on a horse and my daughter can use a brush on her hair you fucking retard is she a horse i don't walk in and wrestle away the horse brush (laughs) It's her brush Ah. she may use, and then there's another brush which has an application for fucking horses, Don Lemon, you fucking idiot liar. And it's Sanjay Gupta, come on, you're fucking physician. Step up a little bit. I know you want to you don't want to be fucking have a bad time at the CNN Christmas party, but fucking speak up. It's just ivermectin. It's not a political thing. You can you can have an opinion. Do you know what kind of uh, hair care products Joe Rogan uses? Horse and mane. Mane That's right. Mane and tail. tail. Come on. How like I would know. (laughs) All right. It's funny. I had this clip from three weeks ago. We never played it, but it was. Uh, I know everyone always accuses uh, Tucker Carlson of being like a hater and a, you know spreads uh, spreads lies and blah blah blah. But he had Brett Weinstein on. I don't know, a month ago. Oh, that guy. And that guy, and that's the guy we interviewed in No Safe Space. <laughs> the guy is, was terrorized. <laughs> just, he was Pacific terrorized Northwest. at his college, and he was talking to Tucker about 
taking ivermectin. And now, now, Iver, now Tucker's a man of the right, so we're, he should have his own spin on it. Like, he should be saying, this is a wonder drug, and, you know, it's not for horses, and blah, blah, blah. But this is what a sort of reasonable conversation on ivermectin sounds like. And uh, Weinstein's a thoughtful, or Weinstein, I never know if I get it right, but it's okay. a thoughtful guy. So Tucker's asking him about what's going on with the COVID protocol in his household. You spoke for an hour for our Fox Nation show. It was one of my favorite conversations. And But we only got in trouble when you mentioned the word ivermectin. And so I cannot resist asking you, at the time you said that you and your wife, with whom you wrote this book, um, have been taking it prophylactically. Are you still doing that? And do you think that it works? Well, the data is noisy. I'm still doing it because the harm uh, is clearly very small and the potential benefit is large. I would uh, suggest I'm not a doctor. People should look into the question themselves and figure out whether or not uh, it is a potentially useful tool in fending off COVID, which is a very serious disease. By that one measure, fending off COVID, has it been effective, do you believe, for you and your wife? Uh, it's a little hard to say because we don't know where we've encountered it. We haven't come down with COVID as far as we know, but I can say that in other countries it has been used to great effect and is now being widely distributed in many places because officials there that have looked at it have concluded it is useful. Huh. So, I mean, countries with rigorous data have, to, have come to that conclusion? Yes. Again, the data set is noisy and reasonable people can disagree, but given the low danger of the drug, uh, giving it to people who either have encountered COVID or are living with people who have just tested positive seems to be very effective at driving down rates of COVID. All right. Well, there's a rational discussion on ivermectin, and we could have had a lot of those about a lot of things throughout the last uh, year and a half. Has Drew taken it? I mean, he had COVID, for God's sake. I think he did take ivermectin. I do not think he's a big fan of it. Drew will be the first guy, if you bring up hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin, to go, hmm, I don't know if it's really effective. And then you go, well, is it dangerous? And he'll go, no, it's not dangerous. So if you want, you know. I think he took ivermectin. I'm almost Feels like sure he he did. Something he would talk Text about. Text him. We'll yeah. Find out. I'm... I'm well, there's, I'm not a physician, what? and we've talked about so many of these different things back and forth, and monoclonal right. antibodies and or whatever. I've got so many the fucking names storm. in my head. Yeah, uh, there's so many terrorist organizations <laughs> competing with uh, therapeutics in my brain that I never thought I'd ever utter. Yeah. But uh, I think Drew took it. I don't know. Send him a text. Uh, but either way, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. See... Um, Weinstein was very thoughtful about it. He's like, it's the the data's messy, but given the dangers of it, which Risk don't war. really exist, then we're just doing it. Does it work? Well, we don't know. Yeah. But we think we, we, we take it anyway. And and we are the disinformation like eye of the storm because I don't know who to believe with anything because now I was talking to somebody recently and they work in the medical field and I they I, I asked them what about this new drug coming out from Pfizer and he goes Pfizer Mectin which is basically just Ivermectin mm. so it's like I, I my head's swimming I don't know what to believe well we should all just be getting a uh, agnostic version of everything, not a this, we know this doesn't work or this is dangerous or that. Just just give us the, uh, obviously everyone's taking a stand one way or the other. I, I, just, I just feel that there's no, that exchange about ivermectin is the exchange we should hear, which is maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. We choose to, we choose to take it. It's not the, it's horse paste and the hospitals are clogged when, they're not. Nobody's doing that. All right. Let me tell you about uh, Simply Safe Wireless Outdoor Security Camera. Big news. Simply Safe just launched their new wireless outdoor security camera system. It's the system U.S. News and World Report named the best home security system 2021. Well, it just got better. Engineered with advanced technology security features to help keep your family safe. Ultra wide, 140 degree field of view. And you can keep a watch over your entire yard. 1080p HD resolution, eight times zoom, so you can clearly see and capture quick, 
critical evidence like faces and license plates, built-in spotlight, color night vision, two-way audio, so you can talk to the person running around your backyard. And uh, simple to set up, takes just minutes, easy to remove, rechargeable battery, doesn't need an outlet, so you don't have to hardwire it. And you can learn more at um, simplysafe.com slash Adam. Simply Safe celebrating their new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service for free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. That's uh, simplysafe.com slash Adam. Save that 20%. Every 60 seconds. Not one, but two children are trafficked. And every 30 seconds, one is forced into exploitation for the purpose of heinous acts. Human trafficking is happening in your own backyard. It is happening to your neighbors. Many whom we see every day in our own communities hidden in plain sight. You know, there's kids out there that are being bought and sold 20 times a day. We must bring the child back to the center of our care and concern. And today we launch Goya Cares. Goya Cares is committed to supporting victims and overcomers of trafficking and abuse to recover, restore, reconnect, and to shine the light that will block traffic. This is where we become the light. God saved me. I believe that I was called to this. Perhaps he's calling you to block traffic. Join Goya Cares and visit blocktraffic.org. Well, back with legendary comedian Rich Scheidner. Rich is, uh, I told you, The Doc, which I, I really loved. Let me, I don't want to screw this up. I Am Comic, 2010. You guys should go uh, watch the slightly darker side of, uh, <laughs> of comedy or the more morose side of comedy. But uh, Rich is a guy I grew up watching on Letterman and to Tonight Show, Carson, uh, Leno and Beyond. So good to see you, Rich. Good to see you, Adam. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about uh, comedy. And I know I want to give a plug to the uh, one man show, A History of Stand Up Comedy from the Civil War to today, 160 years of stand up in uh, 90 minutes. That's uh, October 21st and 22nd at the uh, Yard Theater on Melrose in Los Angeles. Tickets available at eventbrite.com, and you can search for uh, Rich Scheidner. Uh, so, Rich, uh, for you, uh, how does stand-up start? I mean, you were around in the Halcyon days. <laughs> yeah, the, right? pre, the pre-comedy club days, really. really? I started in 1977 in, in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. and there were no comedy clubs there. Uh, I didn't know anybody else doing comedy. There were no open mics. There were, there was, there was just, I, just, I was funny. A friend of mine thought I was funny. We had to get a third opinion, <laughs> and uh, he dragged me over to a coffee house, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I followed a poet. Really? I still have the tape. And the the poet, yeah, like his last line in the poem was, like the mango, we are ripe for the revolution. And, right, uh, 1977. 77, yeah, he was way behind on the revolution. <laughs> right. So uh, you got up, how much time did you do? I don't know, it was around five minutes. We didn't know, I didn't know what the, there wasn't like, oh, I need five minutes for, it It was around five, six, I timed it out. One one reaction, one person went, huh! Like, you know, they started laughing, nobody followed. Right. Then, huh! Like, And right. that was it, that was the whole, whole of it. And what I got ca- heckled. Two guys were playing chess. You can hear it loudly on the tape. They're, just, Shh, they're shushing me. Oh, because they're, they're playing chess they're at playing the coffee chess. house? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what kept you going for round two? That one, one reaction. I got a, huh. That was enough. It was a stranger. Every comic knows you got to go from being funny around your friends in a moment to being funny in demand in front of strangers. And I, I got a stranger who didn't know me. Didn't know, oh, he's a funny guy. I know him. He reacted. And I, did it, I just had to do it again. And it was it back to the same coffee house? No, no, I just kept going. I did come back there, but I just sort of going to places and talking about all these singer songwriter nights around DC, and I talked my way on to those and whatever it was I could get on anywhere. I actually went to a guy who had a pizza place around the corner from me, mm-hmm. and he had like two tables in the front. Mm-hmm. It was basically just takeout, and I talked to him and let me perform for the two tables where people would come in and sit down, and I assaulted them with what I was doing. I, I don't know if they had any idea what, that all of a sudden this guy's talking to them in front of them. I, uh, many years ago when I worked at a house across the street from the house Jay Leno was renting up in the hills, I've told this story on the air before, so I won't bother people too much, but I was probably 21, 22. Jay was getting started, maybe guest hosting tonight show, but maybe not, certainly not a full-time gig. He, he was surprised that I knew who he was. So that's how kind of little he was on TV. Yeah. 
And uh, I saw a schedule, and I saw my schedule, which started at 7 a.m., you know, busting out stucco. <laughs> and I was like, this guy comes out in his bathrobe at noon and gets a paper and heads. I said, what kind of schedule is this? <laughs> For me, I, I was such a blue-collar person yeah. that you you couldn't explain to me the schedule. You know what I mean? Like, how does comp, how do jobs work? Well, for me, the alarm goes off at 6. You get your shit together. You drive to the job site. Yeah. You get yelled at for 8 or 9 hours. And then you go home. And you eat lunch on a pile of drywall. You know? And yeah. I was like, you have a job where you go out to the get the newspaper at noon. You go back in the house. Then you come out at 2 and you work on your motorcycles for a while. And then at, maybe at 8, you head out to go to work. And you're back by 10. What, what kind of fantasy job schedule yeah. is this? Yeah. And so for me, I was like... And Jay was like, I was like, well, what do I do? And he said, eh, go to the deli smoker. I said, what's it? Done? I said, this is a place on uh, Ventura Boulevard. It's called the deli smoker in Studio City. Just go in there. I said, okay. I went in there. It had a giant pole right in front of the. It was not set up to be a comedy club. It, it was, was set up to be a deli. And there was a pole, which didn't bother people sitting on, on ta at tables. But if it was, if, but they had no place else to put the stage. So it's like there was this pole directly in front of you in the audience, which is probably better yep. for the audience. That was the, was the, that was the marker? That was the... This is the, this is the stage, the pole, the pole, and then there was another place. Your pizza joint kind of reminded me of. There was uh, you know Giovanni's or whatever. There's another pizza joint that had like an open mic night or something. It was back when every everyone was having yeah the open mic night. So yeah. when you started, there was nothing in DC. No, no. When I started, everyone was doing an open mic. But it wasn't at, at clubs or anything. No, no. And they were the same thing there. I mean, it was just people doing it around. And then this guy, his, he had this like little country western bar and an Anacostia. And so in the 50s, it was like a white area. Then it kind of changed. Of course, it changed. And, and it was all black area and this little white country bar. And his no no business, just a pension bar, shot and beer. And his, uh, his dad said, do whatever you want to do. And so the guy put an ad in the Washington Post saying, anybody wants to do comedy, come here. And somebody told me about it. And I went there and then I met Louis Black and and uh, Kevin Rooney and, and uh, Ron Zimmerman and John Heyman. All these guys were doing comedy, you know. We started who were some comedy. of the other guys you came up with? When I moved to New York City and the guys that came up with were the guys who were up there was Larry Miller and Jerry Seinfeld, and Rick Overton, Gilbert Gottfried, Mark Schiff. I'm trying to think Glenn was, Hirsch. was was Ron Zimmerman the guy ended up being kind of a writer. Yeah, yeah. And kind of a weird sci fi guy. Yeah, yeah. Well he he did comic books. He wrote comic books. Yeah, yeah. And uh he wrote a lot of a lot of sitcoms. Is Ron Zimmerman still around? So he is. the reason I know Ron Zimmerman is later on then probably seven, eight years after the deli smoker chapter of my life. I, I was a carpenter and I just worked at a certain point. I got off a construction site and I kind of got onto this quasi Hollywood circuit because the assistants all kind of networked and knew each other. And so you'd go over to uh, Katie Seagal's house and you would do a decent job building her fence or some storage in her garage or something. And then her assistant would say to like Ron Zimmerman's assistant, hey, I got this guy. He's pretty clean. Speaks English. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't rifle through the panty drawer of your daughter. At least we have no evidence of that. So he cleans up after himself. And I find myself at Ron Zimmerman's house yeah. building, I built him a fence and stuff like that up in the hills. But I remember walking in and he had all these, figurines all these like you know wolfman and you know the all avengers and stuff like all hanging from the ceiling yeah. and i thought this guy's weird you know it, but it's, he's got money i mean it, his checks it, clear so it cracks I'll do it up the work. When, you, when you talk about you had these skills right and so they would look at you like a complete alien because right. none of them would do anything i mean i used to literally put together everybody's stereo guys would buy stereos and they go you know Scheidner can put it together for you they couldn't right. couldn't hooked up a stereo Right. Yeah, no. It, I mean, a guy couldn't change a flat tire. I went down the street one time, and a guy was standing, a comic was standing there. And I go, what? He's got a, I got a flat. He goes, what do I, I, gotta, what do, I do? I said, I'll change it for you. Yeah. You change a flat. Well, it is. <laughs> I guess if you try to think of professions, yeah. maybe male escort. I'm trying to think of professions that had no other None. actual 
real world tangible skills. Com- comics are way way up there. Uh, again, with the exception of the aforementioned Jay Leno, Leno. who can saw away on a steam for, car all for, day. Hey, first time I met him, he goes, "I was wearing a leather jacket, Heineke uh, German motorcycle jacket." At the improv, and I just moved to LA. He says, you, you wear the jacket, you actually ride. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, Come on, you got a bike. I said, No, I just moved here. I just got to go on up to the house. We'll go, I, got, I got a couple of bikes. We'll go out. Yeah. So I drive it. I had this 62 Chevy. What year you think this, this is? Was? 80, this is 82. Up I to the house up. was probably off of Woodrow Wilson, Wrightwood, or something. Uh, it was, um, um, oh, what's that? Can- Nichols Canyon. Nichols he Canyon. Had a house that, at Nichols Canyon. That's where I is was. That you, is that where you I was working across the okay. street from that house. Yeah, you know, yeah. windy hills, very windy, tight streets. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Nice little little ranch house. Uh, yeah, there. that's it. And so I had a 62 Chevy convertible I just bought. Hadn't done anything to it. I drive up there. He, he's got the garage door open. He's, he's under the hood. And I pull like, up, I turn off the car, he goes, pops out of the hood, he goes, shot, shot, turn it on again, turn it on again. Oh, yeah, it's rough, rough, we gotta tune that up right now. Yeah, pull it up, lean. tune it up. Yeah, I, you can picture going up that hill <laughs> and then walking down the driveway, and then to the right was the garage. Straight you ahead know, was, you know the, was the front door. Yeah. But turn right, and there's there's him. And and back then, that was probably the whole of his collection in that garage. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Had a yeah. couple of bikes couple in there, of bikes and and maybe a Sunbeam Tiger or something in <laughs> he there. Had had that Cobra, that oh, was yeah. his testing. You test your driving. Let's take a ride in a Cobra. Yeah, right. And he'd go over the hills. He'd drive like a maniac. And I knew immediately because you know I just knew from you know that you're he's waiting for you to go slow down, Jay. Right. I didn't say a word. Just smoked a cigarette. Didn't say a word. Yeah, you're all right. You're all right. I think it was. A I test. believe. He had a Sunbeam Tiger as well, which was the... Uh, I don't remember that one, probably. It was a Get Smart car. It was another... It was kind of like a Cobra in that it was a little convert European convertible with a V8. This was a Cobra. I burned my leg on the... And he on, rolled he I rolled burned my leg on the there. exhaust one time. Oh, really? Yeah. The yeah, because had the to, side pipe exhaust I, I on I had there. shorts on and I... <laughs> I was a little drunk or whatever. And so you you went up. Uh, I could have been across the street working while you were in there <laughs> getting your Chevy tuned. But uh, yeah, I, I I called Leno three days ago at his shop, and then his guy answered the phone. He's like, "He's not riding. He's he's the real deal with that shit." Yeah. So <clears throat> when do you come to Los Angeles? Eighty two. Oh, 82. So yeah. you just got here. You yeah. meet Lena. Who else, who else is bopping around here in 82? Oh, 82? then in 82? Well, everybody you can think of. I mean, Shandling and uh, the comedy store had, you know, Kennison was just uh, kind of getting his feet underneath him. And, you know, there was um, Charlie Fleischer was a big deal. Well, Robin was always bopping around from one club to another, Robin Williams. And there were there was uh, everything you could think of at 82. I mean, I it was, you know, it was like the, it was like the time on... The places were packed. The clubs were popping like crazy around the country. I mean, I mean, there were three paying comedy clubs in the late 70s, all in Southern California, mm-hmm. right? By 85, there were like, I don't know, four or 500 comedy clubs in the country, paying comedy clubs where comics right. could work for money. So now you could make a living. Oh, you could make a living. Yeah, you'd go out and every time you get more money. If you could mm-hmm. just, if you were, could hold a crowd. They didn't need, it was... Well, they didn't need to advertise. They need you to have a podcast or have followers on Twitter or anything. It's like they were packed. It's just who could hold. And in the beginning of the 80s was before the drunk driving laws really changed or the whole mm-hmm. ethos was changing. You know? So they were just like, do the show as long as you can. We're selling liquor. We're right. selling liquor here. Comics who sold liquor were the ones who were popular in those clubs. They didn't care whether you. They, they were packed. They didn't need you to draw. Was there uh did you recognize some of these guys? I don't know, Robin Williams or Leno or guys like that and go, oh, yeah, this guy's got the goods. Oh, everywhere we used to fall in to watch them. I mean, comics today, they go, oh, they kind of remember him from The Tonight Show when he moved to the middle of the road, but they forgot. They didn't know. They never saw him. When I first got out there, everybody went in the room to watch Leno. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could get that rhythm going. He'd pound that mic stand like a gavel in between, like pound like a rhythm, like a drum, and he would just pound joke. I mean, just, just. And that strong attitude. I mean, he was he was a top dog. I mean, on the road, I used to go to places, and then, you know, you you could do long shows. So I'd be like, I'd do two and a half hour shows or two hour shows. You go into the club, it's like a challenge. You go, who's, who's got the record? And when I first got on the road, it'd be like, hey, I have forty five minutes an hour. And I go, Kelt got that's gone tonight. And then it start Leno starts going around the clubs, and it's like you go in there, and go, yeah, he did a three and a half hour show, <laughs> four encores. All right, well. He's got that. He's going to keep that one. <laughs> so uh, you start writing, you start acting, yeah. you start, do people 
see you, spot you? Do you remember your first uh, Carson spot? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I was 84, the Olympics were here, so I knew mm -hmm. I'd get out of town. I knew it was going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. And so Sam Kennison was like, yeah, I want to get out of town too. I said, you ever been to New York? He said, no, let's, let's go to New York. So we went to New York for the summer. You and, and Kennison. Yeah, and I was in on stage at the Improv in New York, and uh, Macaulay, who, you know, I knew to stay away from him. I was told, you know, when I got out here, don't bother Macaulay, he'll find you. He was the talent coordinator for The Tonight Show. So he would book the stand-up Right, acts. so people would go up there and they'd bug him, and he didn't like it. And I knew, right. I was told that. So Leno, one of those guys told me. So I was in, in New York, and he came up there afterwards. He said, uh, you're ready for The Tonight Show. Let's, let's do it in two weeks. So he booked me, and I did it in two weeks. We figured out what set to do. That's what you used to do. You just cobble together a set. Yeah, all try official. to get your clean stuff. Yeah. <laughs> You got, you're doing three hours, you have seven minutes of clean <laughs> shit to, to, to work with. Yeah, <laughs> you don't true. realize how much your shit is dirty you until you go. Or repetitive, too. All you right. start going, these are three of the same jokes. <laughs> it's the same joke. I'm just doing a different way. I know, you do 90 minutes, and then you go, we need five clean. And you go, yeah. well, half my act is clean, so I'll pare it down from 45. And it's like, you look at it, you're like, we have eight minutes of clean shit. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you go out in 84. 485? 84, yeah. And First Carson's first. out there. Yeah. Do you remember who was on? The, I don't who, remember who's on the first one. I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't have a lot of, I, I, had, I, had, I had a couple divorces, so I lost a lot of tapes and stuff. I don't know. I don't think I have that tape. And you go on at the end, right? Yeah, yeah, at the end. Yeah. And no, no, 12 o'clock. You always put it going like midnight, midnight. Did you start at 11 show, or go, Yeah, they always put the then. new comic on like 11.30. It was an hour show. And halfway through the show, they put the new comic on. Oh, so it wasn't at the end. No, no. And, uh, God, what was going through your mind back then? It was, you know, you're just blank behind. It's just like, I literally, when I walked out, I forgot everything. And by the time I hit the spot, I remember what I had to do. But when I right. first went behind the curtain... And the guy behind the curtain, he's like, he's like, devil as shit. He got this grin on his face. He goes, it's only like 4 million people watching. Don't worry about it. You know, right. he just kind of grinds a little bit more. Opens the curtain, you go, go get him, tiger. And it kind of like he said a million times to people. And you walk out, and I'm blank. I blank, drew a blank, kind of nodded Johnny, walk over to the spot. And then all of a sudden, it just comes to you. The um, first time I did Letterman, I, I was doing panel. I wasn't doing stand-up. But Letterman, I'd watched you know, for years before that. And I was familiar with all his characters and all the, all the supporting cast, you know? Yeah. And Biff Henderson, who would frequently be seen on the show and I would watch and, you know, some of my friend's mom's apartment when I was 19, I'd watch it. But <laughs> Biff Henderson, who I knew as I thought of him as a celebrity, he's on Letterman. What's Biff Henderson, right? Uh, Chris Blackfella back. I don't know if he's still with us, but anyway, but he also had a job there and the job was to pull the curtain. And so I remember standing backstage, it's Biff Henderson. Like you going out there? And he's like, no, you're going out there. And I'm like, but, but it's Biff Henderson. Like I was so distracted that I get to hang out with Biff Henderson while the band was playing in the back. Biff is 75 and still... Uh, yeah, best known for his work on Letterman. So still still going strong. Stage manager. I, in a weird way... I would get someone else to pull the curtain because I was immediately distracted. Yeah. Like I wanted to talk, I wanted to talk to Biff. Yeah, because yeah. I thought he was a celebrity, and he was. <laughs> I was like, I'll pull the curtain for you, and then you go out there. <laughs> so you did. Uh, how, many, how many times you do uh, the Carson version of the Tonight Show? About a dozen or so. So it went well. Yeah. Second time I got I got a little trouble. I got trouble second time. What'd you do? Uh. You know, too much drinking and drugging. And the night before, uh, my consultant was Sam Kennison, who told me, your ending is too too light, man. You got to have a nastier ending. Got to have a darker, you know, just an edgier ending. Edgier. Mm -hmm. So I went into the Tonight Show the next day and was trying to talk Macaulay and let me do this new bit I was doing about Jesus as an entertainer mm -hmm. and uh, talking to his agent. <laughs> and that was a new bit I was doing. And, and he goes, you can't, you can't do that on Tonight Show. So then I badgered him and let me do those new jokes about. It. Remember the guy that had the, um, uh, I think his name was Barney Clark, the artificial heart, and mm -hmm. jokes about that guy. He was like, that was a thing in the news. It was a big deal. Yeah. So I badgered him, let me do that, and I had a bit about, uh, you know, when you have a heart attack and they had these 
paddles, the defibrillators. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, they always hit you in the, he said, you know, the body jumps in the air. He said, there's got to be a couple of doctors trying to see how high they could get the body to jump. You know, turn right. it up, turn it up, go right. for three feet, you know. So, uh, and I, I, got, I called him a colleague, he goes, all right, I'll let you do those. And Carson hated him, man. Because he's a four pack a day guy smoking. Oh, right. And he's worried about having a heart attack and I'm doing heart attack jokes. And, uh, you know, this time they hustle me right off the, off the stage, hustle me behind the curtain, into the dressing room. Macaulay gives me beer and goes, don't come out. Just stay in here. Don't come out. No matter what you do, don't come out. Mm -hmm. He knew Johnny was pissed in the break. Right. And uh, so it took me like a year or so to get back on. Mm -hmm. But uh, Did you ever run into Johnny? Oh, yeah, yeah. I did panel and uh, things out there. Never talked about that incident or anything. I did panel and I actually had one time where I did the show and made him laugh at an off-the-cuff thing I was doing. I was backing up to the curtain like a gunfighter instead of just walking back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go up to his room, up to his office afterwards. I have this thing and in a couple of minutes. I hung around with Don Rickles and Bob Newhart were there and they're telling stories. I just got to sit in the back and listen and laugh. And that was like a cool moment for me. The uh, We're looking, your first appearance, August 30th, 1984. Wow. Also on the bill, Julia Montgomery. One Life to Live, <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds as well, so you got right. a soap star, uh -huh. and musical guest, uh, He Haw's Own, Roy Clark. Really? Remember Roy Clark? Yeah. He was the- Picking and grinning. Picking and grinning. Yeah. Sort of, they sort of had a Bonanza Hoss-like kind of He did have a kind of guy, vibe. broad face there, broad yeah, show guy, big yeah. Big lantern-jawed guy. I remember seeing him once do like on the Odd Couple, and he played, like, just played guitar on the Odd Couple, and it was just- just, I was like, wow, this guy can really play. Is yeah. Just, well, it's funny. They would kind of, they turn themselves into sort of jokes. Sort of reminds me of that. Oh, yeah. there's that like Hungarian penis guy who was always. Victor Borgia. Victor Borgia. Yeah. And he played concert piano for comedic effect. Yeah. But he had to be able to play concert piano. He was otherwise, it wouldn't work. Classically trained. Yeah, he was a real deal. Right. Do you know you want to know a quick story about him? Victor Borgia. Victor Borgia. So in the 1930s. Was he's, he Hungarian? He was Dan Danish. Denmark. Oh, Danish. Okay. So he's going around Europe performing as a comedic you know, pianist, right? right? And he's doing jokes about the Nazis in the 1930s, right? The difference between dogs and Nazis and Nazis will lift an arm, you know. Right. So then Denmark gets invaded and he keeps doing jokes in occupied Denmark. In about the, the Nazis. In the late 30s. And they are, they're, they're occupied. And right. then he's going to the club one day, and his friend sees him on the street and says, the Gestapo's there looking for you. Don't go to the club. Get out of town. So he wow. jumps on the next freighter, like the last freighter out before they like, lock down the ports. I mean, this is like days after they occupied Denmark. And people talk about cancel culture. I mean, the Nazis mm -hmm. were running the ultimate cancel culture. Yeah. Right? And he, he was doing jokes. I mean, that's guts. But that's balls, man. That's it. Find uh, you can find it, Chris. You can find Victor Borgia. Yeah, he did a whole thing of, of phonetic. Remember, he did that. He pop. He did a whole thing about language. It's funny. I mean, his second English is a second language. He did a lot of stuff about the language. Yeah, he was this great classically yeah. trained piano right. pianist who did comedy. Right. And I just remember I had a grandfather who just thought he was the funniest guy. I saw him once. On I mean, he was, he was funny. Is, uh, yeah, had way about him. There he is. Look at it. There he is. Looking at a picture of uh, the great Victor Borgia. You can yeah. probably find a three-minute, two-minute uh, clip of uh, Victor. Look up uh, on YouTube, Phonetic <laughs> Alphabet. Did, um, yeah, so you bring up cancel culture. So yeah. Nazis, they they actually canceled you <laughs> yeah. for good. Yeah, yeah. Not social media. There was no yeah. coming back like Louis no. C.K. You, <laughs> no, you were no, done no, when no. they canceled you. <laughs> no. And as a comedian, what, what's your head on all this it's always shit been that's there. going on out there? It's always been there. People say, oh, politically correct, but it's always been there. They had, usually it was by the institutions back then, the church or the, or right. the, or the, or the corporation government. Back in 1905, they... They, the Irish and the community and the Jewish community in Cleveland got sick of all the Irish, you know, the Irish jokes back then were drunken wife beaters and the Jewish were, you know, cheap money grubbers. Right. And so they, they boycotted the vaudeville theater. So any more those kind of jokes and, you know, we'll, we'll virtually shut you down. So they stopped doing those jokes. I mean, that's politically correct, right? And yeah. Every, so the cancel culture thing, it's the same thing. They, they tried to cancel. W.C. Field did a temperance lecture where he made fun of the non-drinkers. You know, he did a really? whole thing. Oh, yes. They say, it's, you can't quit drinking. I've quit a thousand times. Right. So, right. And so, they, so the temperance leagues all would try to boycott his shows. They would, they would actually go and, and protest in front of him or call the theater owners or write letters saying, don't book this show anymore. 
Yeah, I guess. There's always sure. Been. First off, humans are humans. Nothing changes. So whatever you think is is new is right. old. And you know, it's it's always funny if you go back and you read. Uh, who said the statement "kids these days"? And then it was like <laughs> Aristotle, <laughs> Socrates, Ulysses, one of those right. guys, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. And so yeah. it's we're humans. That's the way it works. I guess maybe the difference now is technology. Like they're hacking into Gruden's emails. <laughs> that's not Gruden doing a performance. That's no, just no. hacking into some emails yeah. and getting him ousted. Yeah. And that may maybe we've taken it to the next level. But look, I don't get into the outrage because I think that's outrage is the is the is the new delivery system for adrenaline. I mean, people love to be outraged, right? And, and so I don't get that. But but the actual canceling of it, I mean, it's it's changed as who can like in the Chappelle thing with the with the transgender. Mm -hmm. I think it's changed who can say what. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, it, outsider groups in comedy, the more outside you were, right. The, the greater latitude you had to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. Richard Pryor can make fun of anything. He did a, a Chinese stutterer bit, you know. He, right. he, 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 so now it's like, I think with Chappelle, they, they lock it, look at him and go, well, you're a, a straight male first. We identify you as a straight male, so you can't talk about right. transgender or anything like that because you're right. a straight male. Right. I'm, I'm a white old guy. I'm not allowed to talk about old white guys. Right. They don't want to hear from us at all. You shut right. up completely. Right. So I get it. It used to be that if you were a comedian, that gave you license to talk about anything. Now, if you're a comedian, but you're not a black comedian, then you don't have license to talk about the black community, or if you're not gay, if you're not female. So now there's this thing where- Identity. It's like, yes, you can just talk about your own right. somehow. Right. And, and just the whole notion of your own is kind of racist, <laughs> I look at. I, like, I, I don't feel like I have- things in common with white people simply because they're white. <laughs> yeah, there's tons of white people I can't stand, including some family members. Like, why, why would I just go, oh, that guy's white? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, what is, it's, it's insulting. They, it, it, a lot of people don't have a really, they don't listen to where the joke lands. I mean, right. Every joke, somebody's getting a pie in the face, right? But if you right. look at Chappelle's jokes, he was right when his special, when he said, my problem ultimately is with the white people. He was the joke was landing on white people, white women right. or white people, and so they just hear him go transgender and they go ah right, and they don't listen to where the joke goes. They hear the buzzwords. Uh, we have Victor Borgia. So we have two clips of him playing phonetic punctuation. One's from the yeah. '60s on the Ed Sullivan Show, but he doesn't have a piano. If you want a more recent one, when he's older, we have the piano. I'll take the piano okay. since that's how that's how we. Oh, we he's sold next him. to a piano. At least. Oh, he's next to a piano. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a piano there. <laughs> it, that's why my grandfather loved him. But he, he would do one of those things where he'd play the piano and go all the way down the scale and then fall off the <laughs> this bench. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if we'll ever see the likes of Victor Borgia again, right? No, no. He no. was one of a kind. Yeah. In old school, like probably never before. I've never seen him outside of a tuxedo with a bow tie on. No, he, sophisticated audiences, people who would go to see classical music concerts would go to see him. He was not a comedy club. What was it like uh, traveling with and hanging with Sam Kennison? Sam was, he would go until he was done. And he, whoever he passed out would be... He would just go. He would just go in his drop where it was, underneath your console here, if he was done. The show was over, and he made it through the show, and he was done. He would just pass out right there. Would, was the party it, never had to end was his line. The party never has to end. Was it all substance? A lot of substance. But it was a lot of, you know, he, he was a force. He was a real force. I mean, he could go hard for a long time. I, I was not a guy. I was a guy who would keep drinking. But I could not drink, un, you know, his guy could, literally my memory was he could drink people under the table. One of those kind of guys. How how much was he imbibing before he was out on stage? Well, that I don't think he, you know, when he was, my memory was, wasn't. He was a, also a guy like me. I knew I was an alcoholic before I was an alcoholic because I knew I couldn't drink. If I started drinking, no telling what was going to happen. And I couldn't perform under the influence. Right. And I, I don't think Sam did either. Now, he might have gone on, like I did, mess up sometimes, fuck up, and you get on stage, and you're like, oh, shit, I didn't plan this one well. You know? Right. I mean, I had those moments, and you go, oh, shit. And I'd, I remember was once I was too, a little too drunk, and I ran into the bathroom. I'd actually called a break to the audience and ran in the bathroom, did some blow, and came back out, right. trying to balance things out. 
Because you'd been because I was slurring too much. Too much. Yeah, right. I was. I could hear it. I could hear myself. I could see the audience going. We're not quite catching what you're saying there, man. Did uh, did the coke work? Yeah. Then of course I did too much coke, <laughs> and I'd have to have some booze. You can't get the balance right. It's very difficult under game conditions too. You can't. I want to talk about the the uh, history of stand up comedy because I've heard a few people speak about this. Some interesting stories, guys. Oh God, trying to trying to think of uh, some of the some of the names, Will Rogers and guys yeah. like that. I, yeah. I, but you obviously have studied it. Yeah. It's, it's it's the one man show. So yeah. I, I want to get into kind of historically sure. how it worked. We'll do that in a second. First, I'll tell you about Keeps. There are only two FDA approved medications to prevent hair loss. Keeps offers both. By the way. Uh, Keep a, uh, keeps is a, a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair. Convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months in discreet packaging. Low cost. Uh, the treatments start at just 10 bucks per month. Proven results. You can uh, Keeps will help you. Uh, has more five-star reviews than its competitors. And you can check out uh, the before and after photos if you go to their website. Prevention is the key. Treatment can take four to six months to see results, so it's time to act now. You got your hair? Good. Keep it with Keeps. Right, Dawson? If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keps.com slash Adam to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keps.com slash Adam to get your first month free. keps.com slash Adam. Rich Shiner's our guest. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and we'll talk about the history of stand-up comedy from uh, the Civil War to uh, today, right after this. Back with Rich Shiner. Got a one-man show, a history of stand-up comedy. So uh, let's talk about the history of stand-up comedy. Yeah. You uh, start... What is some of the earliest sort of recorded, I don't mean recorded on a recording, but I just mean, you know, of, of what would be stand-up comedy, what would be considered stand-up comedy? Well, I've, I've traced it back to, I think, the first guy, traced it back to a guy named Artemis Ward. Mm -hmm. That's why I say Civil War. He started in 1861, and everything he did was a stand-up comic. He was one person going in front of an audience, and he was out there just for one purpose, on one purpose only, to make him laugh. That's it. And he started doing it then. And um, so I don't have to go, like, what's the kind of maybe. There was nobody doing what he was doing beforehand. It was radical. Where he, was he? It was, uh, he was from Maine originally, but he was a, a print setter, you know, typesetter. Mm -hmm. for, and then he became a newspaper editor in Cleveland at the Plain Dealer. Mm -hmm. And then he moved back to New York City, moved to New York City, and um, hooked up with these bohemians. Walt Whitman, all these people who were bohemians back then, and they... He started um, doing it in New York, New York area, New York City area. He had to find a place to do it. Nobody would let him do it. These lecture halls. Lectures were like the entertainment of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so they put a little bit of comedy in, like comic relief. Like they let the medicine go down. Because they were all, they're always teaching a moral lesson back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, his idea was to go out there and just, as he told Walt Whitman before he went on stage, because Walt Whitman said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to make them laugh as hard as they can for as long as they can. That's it. And he was just out there to make, and nobody was letting him do it. They were, he had a hard time getting a place to do it. And then he finally started doing it and became hugely popular. I mean, he was a big star. It wasn't like he worked obscurely. He, Lincoln was a fan. He met uh, Mark Twain, who was a fan of his before uh, it was Samuel Clemens out, in, out sure. in Virginia City, the mining town. And he did tours every year. He did tours, toured, you know, for, and then he went to England and they declared him a, an American original. That's where I got the whole thing about it being an American original art form and him the first. He went there in England and just said, nothing, everything we sent him there, like, get out of here. You know, you got writers, we got Shakespeare, we got All Chaucer, right. you know, get out of here. And they, he went over there and when he died, he died of consumption at age of 32, tuberculosis. 32? 32. 32, he's 32. And uh, he died over there and the London Times said, this is, we've never seen anything like this. One man making an audience laugh with just using his wit. Mm. And uh, it's an American original. That's what they, that's what they call it. Because their idea of comedy for America then was like a guy in a buckskin suit, you know, hopping around at banjo music. Right. They, they just thought we were rubes, idiots. Did uh, is there any records of his material? Yeah, there is. It, and some of the jokes. I mean, a lot of these loud jokes are tied to the times, like everybody else's. But he had a slacker character, and kind of you reflect the times, right? So back then there was no safety net. There was no social welfare net. There was no, right. you know, you worked hard or you starved. 
Right. So he did a slacker character, which was funny to people. Right. I mean, he'd look, we must all learn to live within our means, even if we have to borrow money to do so. Right. I mean, he, he was, at the time, he was, and this all was new to people. And he did jokes about the Civil War until they couldn't take that anymore. You know, when he first started Civil War, everybody thought it was going to be three months. Right. By year three, the slaughter was so bad, he, he couldn't even do jokes about the Civil War, so he just dropped them. Now, did people see him and they inspired a, a, ne- a next generation? Oh, yeah, people started doing imitations of him right away. And In fact, Twain said, that's how I found out about him, because I thought Twain was the first stand-up. Was, he did these lectures, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and I thought Twain was it. And then I wrote an essay. He talked about the funniest guy I ever saw was Artemis Ward. And then there were like four books written about the guy in the 19th century. And, uh, yeah, there were guys who were inspired by what he was doing. Twain started doing stand-up. He said doing exactly what he saw Artemis Ward do, deadpan comedy, deadpan, you know. Right. Not doing the minstrel mock, you know, or clown clowning around, you know, mocking faces and just deadpan irony. And that's what his style was. And Twain did the same thing. Yeah, because, you know, comedy, you know, there was sort of the 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 tragedy and the comedy and the masks and the, the comedy mask has a big smile and... The deadpan part is something I never really thought about because comedy was joking and laughing and right. energy and movement, right. but there wasn't just thoughts and deadpan. Yeah. He would act like he didn't know it was a joke, which right. made it funnier to people back then. Right. I mean, you couldn't do a whole show. Com- back then, it was if you did if you did um, uh, laugh too much in public, you, you they, they looked at you were laughing at somebody, so it was rude back then. It was rude right. to laugh too much. He did a show. He did a show. He did a, this happened... One of the one of the stories was he comes out of a show, he does a show, he bombs, does his best stuff. Nobody's laughing. Mm-hmm. This little place out in Sacramento. So he's like every comic. I want to know what happened. So he runs around, sneaks around the side of the building to listen to people coming out to what they had to say. So these two old farmers coming out, and one guy goes, "That feller certainly was funny." The other guy says, "Sure was. All I could do not to laugh at him." Right. I mean, it was it was for younger people got him, but older people were like. It's a waste of time. Well, in a way, I guess it's like if you look at any of the pictures or photographs from that era, nobody smiles. Yeah. Because n- not that they wouldn't want to, but it was considered gauche or something. So it's it was like also, it, it was expensive and mm-hmm. you didn't want to move during the flash. Right. So if you smiled, you'd ruin the picture. So they tell you not to la- laugh, not to smile, just sit there quiet, sit there still, you know, and it was expensive. Yeah, they even had. I guess if you look at some of the old pictures of that little head rack thing, <laughs> yeah, that little yeah. caliper that kept your head from moving because yeah. it took so long. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like this. It was like right. second, second, second. So he came around. So he's considered the first guy. Yeah. And then there's some names, you, you know, Mark Twain and right. guys like that who came after that. Was there another then changing of the guard was there another shift after that i mean people remember vaudeville and- vaudeville was the beginning of of, of comics going inside and working clean because before that there were these concert saloons be- between artemis ward and vaudeville and they were just really all men men in bars the women prostitutes and men and alcohol that's what these concert saloons were so they didn't have any kind of monologist you couldn't be subtle that's where you just saw slapstick two guys beating each other with sticks that was comedy back then Right. So there was no chance for guys to develop in those concert saloons. And then when they did vaudeville, vaudeville, they, they go, no single women allowed in vaudeville. So they get rid of the hookers. They go, they want families and kids in. And so it's squeaky clean. You had to work really clean. You couldn't say gosh. You couldn't say darn, slob. These were all words that were outlawed in, in vaudeville. You had to work really clean. No innuendo. Mm-hmm. But there were always young comics trying to, you know, find a line and go over the line. Like Milton Berle was a young comic. We, you and I would think of Milton Berle as like really old. Right. You know, he was a young guy. He was a teenager doing stand up back in the early 20s. And he'd go over the line. He'd, he'd say jokes that would get him fired. And then at some point, that gives way to a more bohemian kind of. I mean, I guess you could look at comedy kind of like you could look at music. It just had its rock and roll era. Time. And went and had its sort of folk singing, you know, unplugged kind of version. And then yeah. there's this sort of big, big version, the subdued version. But it goes from vaudeville. We're talking in the 20s, teens, 20s, mm-hmm, 30s mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. And when does it start to get into the more cerebral 
I mean like stopped. Lenny and Mort Lenny Sol and those guys yeah, in Mort the 50s Sol. and 60s? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's when it happened then. Because it wasn't even an art form until then. It was like a people didn't go in to do comedy. You didn't go in to be, that's the era when people started coming in to be a stand-up comic. Before that, you failed in other things. You were a failed actor, a failed singer, a failed dancer. Bob Hope started off as a dancer. Jack Benny was a violin player. Mm-hmm. And then they, they'd move over to do comedy because if you want to keep working, you got to do something. Comedy was looked down upon. Stand-up comedy was, you know, your jokes are my jokes or mother-in-law jokes. My wife's a bad cook jokes. They're all the same, basically. But when the comics started talking about what mattered to them, right, they changed the art form. And that's like Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce and those comics then, Bob Newhart, Jonathan Winters. Yeah, so it's interesting because a lot of, a lot of comics, I mean, when you get into the vaudevillian stuff, they do a little singing, they do like a little dancing, like Bob Hope would do a little singing, do a little dancing, or you go George Burns, you know, he'd do a little singing, a little yeah, dancing. Yeah. And so in, in his world, that's kind of what you did. You kind of did a little singing, a little dancing, and some jokes. Right? No amplification. So they, the, the, they, were, they were working, you know, just their voice. So you do a lot of mugging, right. visual, you know, Prop singing, dancing, stuff that was you get loud. When the microphone came, electronic microphone, it changed everything again. Then you could be subtle. Then you could do impressions. I mean, before radio and before movies had sound, who were you doing an impression of? Nobody knew what anybody sounded like. And then right. you could be subtle. You could work subtle with it. And then you could control the audience because that it was the biggest weapon against hecklers. Right. I mean, you're you're a heckler out there. The comic on stage is no louder than you are. Right. We're on equal footing. Now, all of a sudden, the comedy's got the microphone. Right. So then we started controlling the crowd. Right. And then you can work subtle. Now you can beat the crowd down in a second, and, and you don't have to be so loud. You don't have to... You can, board, you can do different styles of comedy. As you speak about the microphone, I'm also thinking about TV being able to show, amplify your, your look, your face. You, you didn't have to project out to the back of the you know, back of the crowd anymore. You could right. be, so it, would, it makes sense that it would give way to a more subtle version of comedy that wasn't so big and visual. Well, those, those comics, those young comics back in the 50s and 60s, they couldn't get on TV because they, the TV was went back to the old vaudeville style. Those right. guys who were visual on TV, Bilton and those guys, Jack Carter, all these kind of big banana types. So the young guys weren't getting on because they were looked as too radical. What they wanted to talk about was too radical. So the party albums, the comedy albums came out, and that's where they got their marketing. Like you would a podcast. Like you found a new way to break through to people, right? Because you're not getting on to where you want to get. So there's a new device, a new marketing device. Mm-hmm. But back then it was the comedy album. Mm-hmm. Instead of people listening one at a time like a podcast, people just listening by themselves, they'd have parties in the, in the dorms, or my old man would have it, him, him and his buddies and their wives. They would sit around and listen to these Red Fox party albums and drink. Right, and that was a great. Mar- that's where these people learned of these comics, these com- these party albums, these. So they they started selling tons of albums, and then these guys became famous in underground, and then the network started going. We better try to find a way to get them on TV. Right, so they couldn't get on maybe Mom's Maybe. Couldn't get, they couldn't get on Ed Sullivan. They couldn't get on you know any of those kind of regular network shows. Right, until they got so popular underground. Yeah, I guess it's like someone's super popular on YouTube or TikTok or something now. I mean, new marketing. Not, not, none of it is really new. It's just the technology has changed, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and what do you, and so then you kind of look at it and you go, all right, what's going on? I mean, I guess, I mean, you, you try to kind of look at the trends and you can see if you've clearly illustrated there's there's trends here, some of it has to do with technology, but some Ref- also has to do with sort of social mores yeah, you, and things like that. Yeah, you reflect the times. When you can reflect the times well, right? mm-hmm. when you can reflect, like Jack Benny did this cheap character, right? I mean, he did cheap jokes about him being cheap. Right. Well, when did, was he doing it? During the Great Depression. Everybody had to be thrifty in the Great Depression. Right. You'd have to feel bad about cheap because this guy was the cheapest guy ever. Right. So you could just laugh at him and feel okay. Like Bob Hope in World War II, he does a coward character. Oh, which right, is brilliant. Right, Everybody's right. got to be brave in World War II, but you don't right. feel bad about having your fears inside because this guy's comic relief for it. Right. So yeah. when you can reflect the time, Steve Martin was the best ever at, at, at character. His was perfect for the late 70s. Right. Because he was narcissistic, arrogant, entitled, 
That was mm-hmm. the me decade when everybody was looking inward. I'm okay, you're okay. Right. All those books and everything. And he just mocked it perfectly. And the whole cocaine disco, he right. mocked that whole thing. And even his, even his excuse me. Remember that that one of his yeah. hook lines was that excuse, excuse me. me. It was really fuck you. Right. <laughs> That's what it really was. I mean, it was yeah, like, I never really thought about that. Yeah. And uh, so, what do you see is going on today? What? Uh, who do you like, or where are the trends, or where do you think this is going? Well, obviously, I like Chappelle. I, I already copped it at. I mean, I love Chappelle. I like he's, a, he's one of those line dancers, guys who find the line. Most people, those comics or grocers, they just sell what's on, on the shelf being bought. So they, they, a guy like him will find the line. you got to go over the line to find it, right? What's okay and what's not okay to say in public. And most comics will go over the line, then they come back right inside the line. You know, just mm-hmm. stay safe inside. But he, he goes over the line, just stands about two feet out, daring you, <laughs> daring you to come over to this, this. You know, he just stays outside the line. So I really love him. I always liked the um, Sarah Silverman. I thought her, she had, again, another great character. I mean, when a comic can see how they see you, right? When you were when you were doing comedy, unconsciously or consciously, you figured out how the audience saw you, and you projected that back to them in a comedic way. Like you're a white male, straight male. So if you can project that back to them in a comedic way, mm-hmm. that she figured out, I think, this is my, my take anyway, that they were going to look her and see that classic Jewish American princess stereotype, that arrogant and entitled. Again, almost, she was, it's kind of ironic that she was a huge fan of Steve Martin when she was a kid because she ended up doing a version of that character mm-hmm. herself. So she does deadpan irony mm-hmm. of that Jewish American princess character. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I've never, yeah. I've never studied it like you've studied it, but, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I got time to kill Adam. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you see people, you know, comedians, you know, traditionally kind of push back and I don't know, maybe COVID fucked everyone up, but I didn't feel like they pushed back on COVID. I think they got scared, not scared of COVID, but scared of how they'd be trolled online or what they what would like my my COVID kind of take like okay. the last I don't know 18 months or 20 months or something is I couldn't figure out like more like most comedians they all either live in California or New York most most all of them and those were two states that were being locked down pretty pretty hard and my point was, you guys think Trump is the man, but Trump's not the man. Gavin Newsom's the man. Gavin Newsom is the one who's locking you down. I mean, if you want to push back against the man, then go push back against Gavin Newsom but I, or mask mandates or whatever. Just push back because that's what – it's not do masks work. It's it's comedians push back against mandates or the norms or whatever's being foisted on them. I didn't – I didn't hear. Now, there's some guys you never heard of doing it, but mainstream people you have heard of didn't do it. And I think they were scared. I think they were worried about being called something or losing work. I think it I think it kind of turned into a business decision. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll give you an example, because right. in the NFL, they use the term, you know, business decision. And. When I was coming up, I loved football and, you know, Jack Tatum and Ronnie Lott and all oh. those guys. They didn't make fucking business decisions. <laughs> they were just Roman center field out there playing free safety or strong safety. And if someone came across the middle, they would light them up. And they didn't care, you know, Ronnie Lott, Jack Tatum, uh, Lester Hayes, guys like that. They were giving away 30 pounds to some of these tight ends that were coming across the middle. They didn't care. They'd light him up. Later on, you had sort of your Deion Sanders, and it was like they were making business decisions. Why go flying across the middle and try to light some guy up if I could end up jacking myself up too? And you'll see it now. Like when I was growing up, watch NFL, you never saw a running back run out of bounds. That if you think about it, the last step, they'd turn in and just drill their head, go, especially stepping out of bounds early. Like, you'll see it a lot. Yeah. Wide receiver, skill guy, wheels, catches the ball over the middle, scats around, DB's coming up, and he'll just step out. You didn't pick, you didn't see that in the 70s. You didn't see a guy. Now, look, I'm not saying they're not smart to do it. 
Yeah, but it's a business decision. Well, you consider your running back, you know you're going to have like a couple years before you get the big payday. Right, but so you're trying to extend your career, like a, get a to business. that payday. It's a business. Yeah, it's a business decision. decision. I agree. With I'm you. saying I think there's a lot of well-known comedians who, when it came to COVID, made a business decision. They weren't coming across the middle and going to try to light some guy up. Yeah, they kind of stood back. So the so the ones you talked about are the ones that have something to gain by taking that risk. You got it right. right. If you're trying to make the team, then you're on the special teams. And you're just flying down the fucking field with reckless abandon, and you'll you'll put your head into to the scrum at, at a full full clip. Yeah, because you're trying to make the team. Right. These guys are cagey veterans. They've made the team. <laughs> They'd like to stay they on the team. They want to extend their, their their time on the they team. They want to get to the IR. Yeah. So I've, <laughs> because what mainstream comedian? is pushing back against, you know, mask mandates or, or Newsom or Cuomo or whoever is the, whoever's imposing whatever they're imposing. Right. And again, you can argue over whether it's effective or not. That's not the argument. The argument is comedians push back against what is being imposed. Well, and, comedian, you can say that, or you can say comedians entertain, making people laugh and they're, they're going to no, find the I audience. No, no, I, look, I'm not <laughs> no, saying, I no, I, we're agreeing. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, or... If you have if you have that attitude, if you have I'm not against mandates, I'm against the mask mandates, and you do that humor, you will find your crowd. They're, they're, today it's it's so splintered. It's like balkanization. It used to be, you know, when I come up, there were three networks when I started. You had to get on one of those three networks. You had to appeal to everybody. You had to work clean to get on there. And then it became more and more splintered, more and more possibilities, and ways to get to your audience. And now you can just find that there are com comics to go. Look, I'm sure there are comics doing what you're saying who found their audience out there and doing it. I I agree. My synopsis is really why the main why the household names. Um, how come we haven't heard anything from the household names? You know, essentially doing what you're talking about, Chappelle's doing, but for mask mandates or you know, lockdowns or outdoor dining or whatever's been going on for the last year and a half. I just haven't seen it. And I think they're worried about getting canceled. I, I don't think, I don't think Richard Pryor was worried about getting canceled. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> Sam Kennison was worried about getting canceled. No. I think there's a very real business. Look, you want to get your shit up on the Netflix. You got to, you got to what you got to make business decisions. Well, I, 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 I applaud now. Netflix. I applaud the CEO coming out and saying, I stand behind Chappelle when he got all that grief and, yeah. and said, we're going to put on people that, that uh, may, may, you know, rattle some cages, but I don't know any, I don't know the comics who are holding back. I don't know what their feelings are. I don't know what their opinions are. Well, my argument is, is I don't either. That's why they're holding back. You think that, they, that you think that there are, are comics like, like Jay Leno's against the mask, but he's just afraid of losing audience. So he's yeah, not. I, I think I think Jay Leno, Seinfeld, guys. I'm not. First off, it's not a critique of them. I think they live in the real world. They're right. not wanting to come out and push back against what is a, become a societal norm, which they traditionally do because the optics of it are real, real tough. You could really lose a lot of work out there, and. Network shit. I mean, there's there's a price to be paid. Uh, or Black Lives Matter. Like get okay, out there okay. and make fun I, of Black I, Lives I, I, Matter. I what you're you know saying. what I mean? I what you're like, saying. I'm not gonna. I'm sure many comedians in in the quiet recesses right. have many thoughts about Black Lives Matter, or so, they would have a lot of thoughts about Black Lives Matter, but they don't. Sh they're not really sharing it with a lot of people. So so the uh, Greg Gutfeld his show right right on Fox. So there'll be comics come on there to do that. I think yeah. Nick DiPaolo would be somebody who'd come on there and, and do jokes about that. Yes. I think you just have to find No, it. no, it is it is given birth to a a small group who are willing to do it. But uh, you bring up Nick DiPaolo. I love Nick DiPaolo, but I'm talking Seinfeld, Leno, like I'm not it takes a little while to get down to Nick DiPaolo. No, Nick, no, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. There's there's going to be comedians that do it. I'm just saying the 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 Mount Rushmore, not even the Mount Rushmore, but just the 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 household name comedians right. who would normally, right. you know, Richard Pryor, Sam Kennison, they would all have a lot of thoughts about this. Is basically what I'm saying. the The silence of no thoughts about it is 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 telling to me. It suggests that they don't want to be cast out, or there's a fear that they could be 
cast out. I don't know what their feelings are about it. I mean, I don't know what Chappelle's feelings are about mask mandates. I don't know what, I don't know anybody's feelings about it unless I hear them talk about it. But it does, it doesn't, what I'm saying is, and we're going in a circle now, but what I'm saying is, is <laughs> it's not even really their feelings. They would be making fun of it. You're compelled to make fun of absolutely, what you're is. Absolutely of right. What is. Absolutely. You know what there I mean? Should like, be, there should be that. There absolutely should be if, that. If somebody, I've if heard you, people if talk you took, about If you know, took something innocuous, let's just say, forget about mass mandates okay. and COVID. Let's just say people started wearing a goofy hat and it became really popular and almost everyone was wearing the goofy hat at the mall, but it wasn't attached to disease or COVID or anything. Then you'd get up there and and every comedian would have tight 10 minutes on the goofy hat. You're right. The fact that you get up there and don't have anything to say about the mask suggests that they're kind of avoiding it. And look, rightfully so. Like I said, it's a, it's a business decision. We have proven that there's revenue to be lost. If you get out there and start, Going yeah, I've heard, against I've, some I've of the heard people doing jokes, but they're all about forgetting their mask or not leaving a house with a mask, right? And having to drive all the way home before you go to the store. I've heard those kind of stories and jokes, but you're right; they're not actually attacking the mask mandate itself, just our ability to live within it. I understand right. what you're saying. Yeah. So I think it's a different time, and I think social media has. I mean, I don't. You've probably talked. It seems like every third person I interview, I just talk to them after the show, and they go, "Man, I don't know how you get to talk about shit. I'm scared to talk. I don't want to get, I don't want to get into trouble. Like I'm in a band, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. I just don't want to do this. Yeah. It's not a, it's not yeah. a good time. No, if you have a bunch of people sort of vetting everything they say. Because it's not certainly what you want comedians to do. It's amplified. It used to be, you know, you didn't hear somebody's opinion unless you're next to them on a bar stool. You don't want to hear it. You move over to stools. You don't hear it anymore. Mm-hmm. But now it's like nonstop. People think they're they're publishers when they're on Facebook, and everybody's got an opinion about everything all the time. And like you said, there's a mob thing that happens too. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree. It's a different time for comedians to think about. And I'm I'm not in a career, so I don't care. I mean, I'll talk about the Chappelle thing with you, like I did earlier, because I don't care. I don't have a career I'm protecting. Right. You know? I, I mean, no. Oh. I'm doing I mean, this yeah. for fun. <laughs> I mean, I see. I mean, <laughs> that's when you even caught that you. yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Well, let me give a plug again. Right. The one man show. I Obviously, you've studied the subject quite it's uh, funny i mean the show's like, funny it's stories i know and, it has to be it, it has to be funny you can't talk for 90 minutes about stand-up and not be funny yeah, that's, <laughs> that's when i was trying to write the book that's when it looked like a textbook and and so i started uh just performing it and doing it and that way it forced me to be funny it uh well you're such a seasoned stand-up that you get up on stage you hold a microphone and eventually a eulogy is going to start. <laughs> Seriously, you ever yeah. see comedians at a eulogy? Oh, it's like the, the comedy's flying. Oh, my they got God, a crowd. Yeah. They got a mic. Yeah. Takes about yeah. a tenth of a second for that for that gene to kick <laughs> in, right? That's it. That's I it. mean, uh, Super Dave's, I don't know if you went out to uh, no, Super Dave's uh, Wake. It was one of the funniest stand-up shows I've ever been to. Oh, I bet it was. I bet it was. His brother alone. Oh, Albert? Oh, oh, my God. He's the funniest guy. Albert Brooks? Yeah, I, I, I idolized him growing up. I, I love I just, Albert Brooks. Love him. And and many, many others. And it was like an all-star lineup oh. of comedians. Larry who, David was there, right? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Seinfeld was there. Like, oh. They thought Sarah Silverman was there. They thought yeah. they were delivering a wake, but it just turned into a stand-up <laughs> show. They're the best. It's They're great. The best. And by the way, no, there was, there was nothing disrespectful about no. it. Everyone's laughing their ass off. No, it's the yeah, way. Yeah, uh, he was a character, and they're doing funny it. stories about him. And I'm sure it was hilarious. I uh, I did enjoy it. All right, uh, <laughs> it's October 21st and 22nd at the Yard Theater on Melrose in Los Angeles. Tickets at uh, Eventbrite.com, and you can just go there and then search out uh, Rich Scheidner. Uh, website Rich Scheidner. Um, let me spell that out. S H Y D N E R dot com. Rich, always great to uh, talk comedy with such a yeah. seasoned I, veteran. Uh, you made me think about something. I got to after the show. I have to think about that. Think the about whole mask it. mandate thing. Why there's nobody? I have to. Yeah, it's good. I like it. And I couldn't perform under the influence. Right. And I, I don't think Sam did either. Now he might have gone on like I did, mess up sometimes, fuck up, and you get on stage and you're like, oh shit. I didn't plan this one well. 
you know? Right. I mean, I had those moments, and you go, oh, shit. And I'd, I remember was once I was too, a little too drunk, and I ran into the bathroom. I actually called a break to the audience and ran in the bathroom, did some blow, and came back out.